So, welcome everyone to the first monumental Soil Carbon Climate Summit uh, here in Bedford, Vermont. It's a real honor to be here um, and to have a pretty good turnout. It looks like a pretty good turnout, doesn't it? Look at that. Um, this is also the kickoff of the Soil for Climate Movement. Um, and um, so with that hashtag, and you'll be hearing more about that. Um, so we're here today to discuss uh, soil as a powerful tool to help uh, reverse global warming, and specifically to help draw carbon out of the atmosphere into soil. And um, uh, we see that as an important sort of evolving narrative in the climate movement. The climate movement obviously has the narrative that we have to stop burning fossil fuels, which is of course true, we all know that. But there's another part of the narrative also, which is that if we restore soils around the world, we can draw prodigious amounts of carbon out of the atmosphere and um, help reverse global warming. So this, this presentation will focus on that part of it. And um, first, I just want to say um, how delighted I am to all the people who have helped um, um, you know, organize this event and put it together. Um, tonight's program is going to have um, Professor Dr. William Bill Mouma um, from Tufts University, now the chief scientist at Earthwatch. Um, and uh, he's going to be talking about policy and trying to get this narrative into the climate um, mitigation discussions. And I'm so delighted to have Dr. Mouma here. We just stand for a second. And say. Um, uh, Bill and I go way back, so I'm a graduate of Tufts University, so there's definitely sort of a Tufts sort of spin on this event tonight. And, um, and, uh, and the, the way the meeting's going to work is I'm going to make some opening remarks, and um, well, there'll be three speakers who will make some opening uh, presentations, and then we'll take a short break. And maybe we'll take a shower or something. <laughs> and then and then Bill and then Bill Mama will speak. So so my name is Seth Itzcan, and um, um, so I'm a graduate of Tufts University, and I've been a climate activist for for decades. And I have a, a home in, in Thetford. I've been coming up here for for 30 years or so. I'm friends with the, the Jukachi family, and uh, so they've been very welcoming of me here. And um, um, Alex Jokachi is here, and he is the co-chair of the Upper Valley Climate Change Mitigation and Resilience Work Group. Is that correct? <laughs> you said it better than I said it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think so. Tonight's presentation. So you'll hear a little. You'll see a presentation from me, and then from Didi Kirtzhouse, and from Joanna Brown, who just got off the plane, literally. <laughs> hours ago, practically, um, from two months in Zimbabwe, where she was working at the Africa Center for Holistic Management. And she is doing her, uh, she's there on a, a research fellowship uh, from the Tufts Institute for the Environment. So it's nice to have a young scientist here, and an old scientist. Old scientist. <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of middle-aged middle activists. Um, so, um, yeah, all right, so I'm just gonna kinda gonna go through this quickly. Yeah, go on to the to the next slide. Um, yeah, just see. Oh, oh you did. Oh, okay. All right, so all right, that's fine. Um, so I mean basically this isn't Thetford, obviously, but but um, you know, I got interested in climate change, I don't know, almost like twenty years ago and, and, and like everyone else, um, you know, it was about cutting emissions and getting cleaner, better technology, which is true of course. But then about, I don't know exactly when it happened, but I began to become aware of the profound power of soils to, to sequester carbon and, um, and, and, and the magnitude that it can actually make. And then um, I became aware of something called holistic management or holistic plant grazing, which is a, a form of using animals to help restore depleted grasslands. And then I became aware of how big the grasslands were around the world. Um, 
something like 40% of the landed surface of the Earth is, is grasslands or steep or savanna, some version of that. And there's prodigious amounts of carbon in the soil there, but over, over, the, over the millennia, you know, for thousands of years, long before we invented fossil fuels, we've been depleting the soil. Um, but this new type of management is bringing it back. So I decided to go to Zimbabwe um, three times and also to go to South Africa to learn about this for myself. And so, and so there's some overlap with what I'm going to present and, and, with, and with what Joanna's going to present because she just came back from that part of the world. Um, but obviously, there's many different types of soils in the world and there's many different types of restoration that's possible all of which we have to do. I mean, in, in New England, of course, it's naturally a forested area. Um, um, and there are wetlands areas that need to be restored. It's the whole thing. It just happens to be that my personal experience has been in the dry land areas, as has Joanna's. But Dee Dee has been working here in Thetford, and Bill will report about stuff from all over the world. So it's the whole thing. It's not just dry lands or grazing. That just happens to be the area where I've had personal experience. Um, and so this picture, is, this is a fence line from Peru, South Africa. Um, and then I guess what, what I like to, the way I like to start it is by asking the audience, how would you describe the, the terrain to my right or to your left? How would you describe that terrain, just real quick? Grasslands. You would call it a grasslands. Any no. other? Everyone agree with that? Felt, felt. Okay, well, you're from there, so you know the uh, you know the, the Dutch term. Um, so, how would you describe the land to my left? Wasteland. Desert. Desert. Wasteland. Desert. Desertification. Desertification. Now, isn't it really uh, nice of them to put the fence right at the boundary between those two? <laughs> okay. So, um, is there the same amount of rain on both sides? Yes. Okay. Probably, right? Right? Okay. But but rain is always considered the universal parameter in determining the difference of an ecosystem. So um, let's just go to the next slide. And um, so in the in the grassland area, so carbon and water are being sequestered or pulled into the soil there, and you can go on to the next slide. And um, on the desert side, it's being lost. And this is the story. This the desert side is a five, seven thousand year old story. As soon as, as long as humans have been killing the megahertz and burning, and plowing, we've been having the left mind side of the story. You're right, the desert side. So we want to try to reverse that. And so that's what this is about because it's very exciting. And then let's go on to the next slide. And I just say, um, which side gets more rain? And which do you prefer? So what's happening here is on the good side, it's a holistically managed um, sheep farm. And on the left, on the bad side, it's traditional grazing. Ever less and less animals, and the land just gets worse and worse. So he's actually increasing the animals, but he's managing them in this herd way, which helps revitalize the soil and bring it back. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll just, I'll go like this. So, okay. So, um, so the main point that I just sort of wanted to get is about sort of is about holism and that climate and soils um, and and biodiversity it's all part of one whole. Um, and then there you go. And then I just thought this is actually the best presentation of this concept I've ever seen. It it happens to be a U.S. plate block of stamps, but it's the best picture I've seen anywhere of the ecosystem of the Great Plains, and. What I love about this picture, you see in the back um, the, um, the rain clouds in the back, and you see that sort of storm. You get the sense that when it rains, it's really going to stay. Like the moisture is going to stay in the soil, right? It's not going to rush off. Um, <laughs> um, so this is just me at the, uh, at the corral in Zimbabwe. Yeah, we can go on. Um, and then, so, so here are pictures of contig contiguous properties taken on the same day. And so, on one you have extreme desertification and silting of the river, and on the other you have extremely healthy um, grass and, and a very healthy river as well. Same, you know, like contiguous properties, same day, 
And then um, the difference is that one actually has four times the livestock density as the other, but it's the healthy land that's four times the livestock density. They've restored it by bringing the animals back, managing them in a way um, as a, a, a simile of what the wild herds there used to be like. And then here's just an example of the reversal of desertification over just a few years. And, and you can see it was, well, what did they say? That's basically, okay, 100% fair ground. And then let's continue. And then once they begin bringing the animals back in what they call a crawl or a corral, and they, they impact the area with dung and trampling and, and urine, immediately in the next year, you begin to get the first opportunistic grasses. You begin to get cover. And then the very next year, you have very good cover. So now when it rains, the moisture will stay there. It won't just go away. And um, so, well, this was me at that spot, at that same spot two years ago. And go to the next slide. And what you're seeing in here now is, I'm going to stand here as you can see. These are, these are now the big perennial, deep-rooted perennial plants, which are beginning to show up. I mean, it's not the clearest thing in the world on this picture, but you can see this. This is called heteropogon contortus. Um, they also call it spear grass. But the point is, this is big grass. And, and after eight years, it just started to spring up. So you, you had the regular uh, cover like this, like immediately. Within a few years, you had that. But then all of a sudden, after about eight years, the bigger grass just started to show up everywhere. So what that means is that underground, the conditions were changing, right? Soil was being restored underground, and carbon was being sequestered underground to the point where now the bigger grass can come up. And let's just go. That just shows the change under, uh, over time. And you see, the bigger grass isn't even there in the previous, in the previous year. And then, and then it, well, I'm sorry, that's not the previous year, but, but they said, when I went there in 2013, they said this stuff just started coming up. And then yeah, go on to the next one. And, and so this, here you can see it better here. These are the, the deeper rooted perennials, which just started showing up. Now these pictures are all dry season pictures, which is typically how you do a comparison. But I did go back there again in the wet season. Here's the same spot. And so now we have, we have yet another type of uh, plant called Panica maximum. And this is really sort of a climax grass. This is, this is grass that only grows in the best conditions. Um, and go to the next slide. And then, so here you can see the seed heads. It's like this tiny, tiny little seed. This can't possibly grow in that dry, arid environment, right? This, this plant can only exist if the soil is really good. And here's how it looked before. And then go on to the next slide. And then, so here's me holding, holding the root system of, of the perennial grass. Here's the seed, seed head. Here's fungus and centipedes in the soil here. And why is soil dark? Carbon. carbon. That's right. That's the only reason why soil is dark. Where did that carbon come from? The air. Yes. The air. That's the only place it came from. Um, this is just looking back the other way. You can see the tall perennial grass here. It's beginning to come up here, here. It's beginning to come up all over. Okay, let's go on. Uh, yeah, hit the next one. And then this is just something I call the future scope. It's just kind of a fun way of comparing change over time. Um, let's, let's just move forward, actually. Uh, here's, a, here's, another, here's another example. We call this the elbow site because of this thing. And then go to the next slide. And then that's just a couple years later. All right, same, exact same spot. Um, and then go on again. And then, and then there it is from the distance. And that's Alan Savory. Uh, let's go on. Again, the next one. And then that's just your, I call this the future scope, so you can see the change over time. So you see, when I look at desert now, I see what it can be, which is actually what it was. Um, Excuse me, sir. Yeah. If I may, I'd like to elaborate on one of the points that you made earlier. Go for it, Carl. And that is um, specifically how the transformation happens from the desert to the grassland 
And then the slide that Seth showed with a fence running down the middle on one side was the desert. On that side, is, it's being grazed conventionally. And what that means is animals have free access to every plant in the pasture all season long. As a result, no plant gets to grow to maturity. Whenever a plant starts to come up, a cow will go along and nibble it. Over time, what happens is the land begins to die because the plants are no longer growing effectively on that side. And what Alan Savory realized uh, 40 years ago when he was in charge of setting up uh, wildlife parks is that the land inside the parks where the animals were protected inevitably began to degrade, whereas outside the parks where the herds were still coming through once or twice a year retained their fertility and their fecundity. And he began to understand that it has something to do with this infrequent trampling that's part of the, of the key. So he began to move his herds in a totally different way than mimic nature. He took all of his animals, instead of allowing them free access, bunched them all together, and every day or two, or maybe once a week, some folks do it every uh, twice a day, he moved all the animals together as a herd to a slightly new spot. They would graze there, and then the next day, he would come back and move them to a new spot. He would never allow them to regraze the original patch until two months, four months, six months or more had passed, and that allowed the grasses time to grow. And it turns out this is exactly how animals graze in nature. Out in nature, any place you find um, prey, you always find predators. And they'll always bunch together. If you see a dozen cows grazing in a pasture, if you just let one wolf and one coyote in, immediately the animals will bunch together for safety in a herd in the same way that uh, birds flock together and fish school together. It's a common pattern, a generalized principle that's repeated throughout the animal kingdom. So animals would always be bunched together. And then because of... Uh, while they were eating, they would of course be dunging and urinating all the time, and no animal likes to eat where it has dunged, so they would constantly be searching for new forage, so they would always be looking for a fresh patch of land, and they would never come back and regraze until enough weathering had happened for the odor of the dung to be dissipated, and that allowed time for the plants to grow. So this is a pattern that evolved over millions and millions of years between the grasses and the soils and the animals that assured that the effect of the animals on the land would be restorative and regenerative instead of destructive, which is what we all assume grazing is. But in fact, overgrazing, as I've learned from Seth, is a human invention. There was no overgrazing until humans arrived on the scene and thought we were protecting the animals. What harm will be doing when in fact we're having a devastating effect on the environment? Thank you, Carl, for that elicitation. We can talk more about the specifics of the grazing management uh, after. Uh, let's just let's just move on real quick. I'm just going to go. Now, this is a great story about how they changed the hydrology and the catchment over a matter of 10 years of improving the soil quality. You also improve the filtration of the water into the water table, so it doesn't just run off. And over about 10 years of doing this, the um, the the high water mark for the um, river in the dry season moved up about a kilometer and a half. So this used to be the high water mark in the dry season for the river. Elephants would bathe there. They called it the elephant baths. This is the Pigong Gombe River. So I will tell you more about that in a minute. But after about 10 years of improving uh, the catchment here, they now have uh, standing water year round a mile, kilometer and a half up. So, so the counterintuitive, it's really not if you think about it, but by increasing the animal impact, they increased the water availability on the land. It's not the other way around. They actually brought the water back by bringing back the soil. Um, and then there's just the river that's, that's going north, uh, upstream, and then there's the new pools, and, and you can go right on to the, the next slide. And, um, so they actually had a pump there. They don't need pumps. The, the pump requirement went down as a result of bringing more animals back and managing them appropriately. Uh, let's just go to the next slide. Here's just some examples of transformation over, over many decades in this case. Um, and this is the same spot many decades later. And then hit the back button again for a second to get previous. And so what I like to ask, if you can imagine the two next to each other, is which picture has more water? This one, and now go to the next slide. Or this one. Okay. This one actually has six times as much water. And they know this because in the previous slide, the water that was in there was from a one-inch rain. There was no place for it to go, so it just went right into the trough. He says he can get a six-inch rain now and not have standing water in the depression. So the, the biology there is holding at least six times more water 
than in the previous slide. And then, just real quick, I, uh, these are just more examples of restoration. Or this is a sort of a massive fence line picture, kind of like the one you saw before. Uh, this is your typical sort of Kalahari red sands. This is taken uh, on the border of Laboa in South Africa. Laboa doesn't exist anymore, but it was a free state in the 70s. And, um, but what you see here is you see the grass coming back because we're doing the grazing here. And here's just exposed red sands. Um, and then here was an example in, also in South Africa that I was very happy to be witness to. Um, this, is, this land, like a lot of the land there, was plowed for wheat, uh, it was, it, which was destroying the soil. Uh, you can see the old contour lines of where they used to plow, and now they're bringing it back to grazing. And it's just really wonderful to see the soil coming back. You can see the old contour lines. So it's coming back to pasture, which means it's coming back to having deep soil. And um, okay, let's, let's just go on. I mean, so these are all just examples of restoration. Uh, but let me get to the carbon part of it. Let's just move on a little more. Um, you know, this is, this is really why we're here today. So, so soil, I don't know if you can see this number, but this is 2,300 gigatons of carbon, or 2.3 teratons of carbon. So there's much more carbon in the soil of the world than there is in all the plants, everything above ground, and the atmosphere combined. There's a, well, there, we're up to 800 um, gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere now, about 550 in plant matter, including trees, and yet 2,300 gigatons in soil. So carbon, soil is by far the biggest terrestrial sink of carbon. Um, and so grasslands happen to be the largest ecosystem. So that's why I got interested in grasslands. And let's just, let's just move. Yeah, let's just move forward. Um, so here's an example of desertification. This, is, uh, this was New Mexico from the 1950s. But this is Texas blue stem. Um, Ander Pogan Girardi, related to the Ander Pogan, uh, the heterocogan or whatever it was in Cal, in uh, forgetting my Latin, but, but the, the same uh, the family of the same plant that I was showing you, that tall plant in Africa. Exactly, uh, you know, very similar genus. And, and look at what the root systems are like. You know, here this guy is showing you. That's almost five foot root system. That's good soil. That's carbon that's being lost into the atmosphere. And if it was lost, it can be re-sucked up again. And um, so these are just some maps that show the soil organic carbon density measured in tons per hectare around the world. And um, let's go to the next slide, because I kind of zoomed in a little bit there. And I kind of labeled them so you could see um, you know, basically, at 100 tons per hectare, that's considered really good uh, agricultural land. Um, but most of the land in the world, most of the sort of dry lands or grasslands, are really sort of in this range here, sort of like 75 to, to 25, um, or around 100 or so. This is sort of the range the grasslands are in. And you could think of desertification as going this way. It's going down. And reversing desertification, you want to bring it back. So I see that that's our opportunity. And, and next slide. So these are just some examples from data that's out there that you, know, you could look up. But basically, um, you know, the, the delta here that I'm interested in is between the tropical savanna and the desert, semi-desert, about 63 uh, tons per hectare is the difference of that ecosystem. And you see, these ecosystems are, are, are um, they're facile, right? One ecosystem could move into the other or could move back again, depending on your management. And so let's just move on. These are just other examples of the delta or the opportunity there. Um, let's go on to the next one. This is a recent study from North Texas that Professor Teague at Texas A&M did, comparing the holistically managed ranches with the conventional uh, ranches. And he found that in the holistically managed ranches, which is 
more paddocks, more animals densely put together, moving more often. They had 147 tons per hectare of carbon versus 117. And these are like on ranches, same soil, same everything, same county, um, but just different practice. So there's a 30 ton per hectare difference between those two. And that's a lot. Um, at, because you're talking about billions of hectares, right, around the world. And then go to the next slide. And then, um, so I, I did my own estimate of around 25 to 60 ton per hectare delta over 3.5 um, billion hectares uh, gives you 88 to 210 gigatons of carbon. So that's an opportunity of carbon that could come back into the soils of the world. And that would equate to about between 40 and 100 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. And as you know now, we're at close to 400 already. And really to have a livable climate, we need to get back. We need to get back to a more like 300. So just stopping fossil fuels doesn't get us back to 300. We still need to take 100 parts per million CO2 out of the atmosphere. Where's it going to go? It's going to go in the soils of the world. OK, everybody, thank you very much. Sorry. Organic Farming Association. 
they had a whole track of classes on soil carbon. And, um, and I took everything I could take and was completely um, excited by the whole thing. And the last class that was on the program sounded a little bit boring. It was called Monitoring Carbon in the Soil. And I thought, ooh, that sounds kind of like science class. Um, and next slide. And I went, and there was this guy, Peter Donovan, who then I, about halfway through his talk, realized was the same person who was in the first chapter of Judy's book. Um, and he, um, about four years ago, he had, he had worked as a uh, shepherd for a lot of his life and um, studied holistic pasture management with Alan Savory and became a teacher of that. And then at some point was at a conference where someone said, you can't prove that soils will hold, can hold carbon and that, that, and that it makes any difference. You know, you can't prove that management makes a difference. So he sold all his belongings, moved into that school bus, and started traveling around North America and Canada and Mexico and um, measuring changes in soil carbon over time um, at different ranches and farms where they were managing for carbon. They were, these people call themselves carbon farmers or carbon cowboys or carbon cowgirls. Um, um, they're managing their land. They say, we're not growing vegetables or we're not growing cat cattle. We're, we're growing microorganisms in the soil. And the microorganisms in the soil um, create the structure that allows the water and the oxygen to move down in. And that, and that allows the plants to grow, and that allows more microorganisms and fungi to grow. And so all of that life that's growing in the soil is the carbon in the soil. And then there's this other pathway that got discovered more recently called the liquid carbon pathway, which is how that, that whole system translates into more deeper, longer-term storage of the more kind of uh, stable carbon. It's sort of almost like a precursor to what becomes petroleum. Okay, so um, so I invited Peter here to teach a workshop, um, and um, I, I, you know, right after the conference, I said, I, I want to know how to do what you're doing. Um, he taught me how to measure soil carbon, um, change in soil carbon over time, and um, and then in October, uh, we went up to Saskatchewan, Canada, um, to visit. Uh, and do, and do testing at a bunch of the ranches there that are using this practice to restore soil up there. Now, next one. So, actually, go back one. So it's a really interesting landscape up here because it's a big, big oil landscape. Um, everywhere you go, even in these holistically managed pastures, there are these oil wells creaking along. And then at night, all you see are these flames of the, them burning off the gas from the oil wells. Um, so, and right before we came, they had had terrible flooding, like two or three months before. And most of the fields there are, are wheat and canola fields. And all of those traditional farmers um, couldn't, they basically couldn't grow anything because the water wouldn't sink into the soil. There was none of that soil aggregate structure that I was talking about. This, there were no microorganisms left because they were tilling the soil, which kills them off, exposing them to heat. They were putting chemicals on that kills them off. So there was no, the soil was compacted, um, the water just sat in the fields and turned into mud, and the seeds were rotting in the ground. Um, actually, uh, well, so, so um, the farms that we looked at, though, well, they haven't had any trouble with the flood. And just about 14 years before that, they were wheat and canola fields themselves. Um, go ahead, a couple. So this is Blaine Dirtis, who was, who was um, the host that we stayed with for most of the time. And he was, used to be an oil worker and he built, um, <laughs> I love, he, he built these fences out of old oil pipes. <laughs> um, what a great, you know, like turning what is this, swords into plowshares, so turning oil, oil, oil pipes <laughs> into cattle fencing. Um, and um, he said that when he was farming traditionally, he, you know, he was from Norway, his family had moved there and um, many generations back and and he said this 15 years ago that his his soil stank because basically things were just rotting it was not it was no longer a living system it was like a cesspool and he said that he was buying his crop at the store because he had to pay so much for this GMO seeds for the chemicals for everything else. actually he was not a GMO farmer but he was a chemical farmer um, 
that was before ground up ready crops. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and he realized that he was he was he was about to start losing money because it was such a tiny profit margin. And he took this class in holistic pasture management and decided to go back to um, turn the land back into a grassland and start farming animals. Um, and so we, we got them a few months later. We got the results back from all these different farms we tested, and um, in a square mile of this land. He was putting enough carbon back into the ground in the form of life to offset the CO2 uh, emissions of 350 Canadian citizens on a square mile every year. Okay? Now, these, this is another time of the court um, and they were doing the double So, one square mile at the Corcoran's is offsetting the CO2 outputs of 800 Canadian citizens every year. And there are not 800 Canadian citizens in a square mile in Saskatchewan. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> right, Tamron agrees. <laughs> um, okay, let's see what's next. So here, that's the next one. Yeah, that's sort of the same thing. Um, and and yeah, just interestingly, that from past studies, this was five to ten times more than what we expected to see. Uh, they've been doing this about 15 years. 15 years ago. Yep. Yeah, they all, this whole area started together. Did you said it was five to ten times more than what you expected? Is there something Five to ten times more than what previous studies had shown. So what we have, we've moved to the what we have now is we have a lot of university studies that have that they're they're small. They're what they you know they don't last that long. There's a few longer term studies. Um, Seth alluded to some, but but they're very minimal and they're in particular places. So Peter's project that I've joined in on is managing, it is looking at management all over the place. Um, I mean, right now it's just North America, but we're we're looking for data that thinks Joanne may be one of our next <laughs> people from Africa um, to try to fill in the dots on the map of like what's possible in this area. And for example, here, if you were going to um, learn from one of these people as much as I love Blaine. I would want to learn from the Corcorans because they're doing, you know, they're getting twice as much in their land. Um, in California, the plots that we're monitoring in California, um, during the drought there, most of them were kind of just fiddling along. But one, Joe, Joe and Julie Morris's place, is had a really substantial gain. So, like, what's different? What are they doing differently? So that's the next stage is to, is to figure that. What was the land? No, no, these are these are pretty similar in the state. So um, this is Neil Dennis, um, who um, uh, hasn't read a book since he was ten years old, um, and speaks at conferences all over the uh, raising conferences all over the place because he's a genius at fencing, and fencing is really key with the, with this. He's sort of the uh, Temple Grand and offensive. <laughs> and you can see this vehicle that he invented, the vehicle, and it's got little fence posts here that he just drives it along and they do this thing. And he's figured out ways to train the cattle when he gets them so that they will move in a zigzag when you want to get them moved. So you can just move one little piece here and then they go here and then the next day you just one little piece here. I think that he's movable. Movable fences, yeah. So, um, so, so how do we find these leaders? We find them by collecting data and figuring out who's, who's got the system that works. Um, and that's what this map, the Ethics Soil Carbon Coalition, we're trying to put together a map that's about to get much bigger. Um, Peter's right now designing something that's going to kind of put together Google Earth Engine, Wikipedia, and a social media network that we can really start putting lots of data in, get schools, get conservation commissions, get other people involved to find out what's happening where, what's happening fastest, and who really knows what they're doing in terms of management. And that way we can have we can have our policy based on a really solid base of, of data that's open data that everyone can see, not not sitting in some closed cabinet in a in an institution somewhere. Um, rather than just a little tiny bit of data that we're trying to guess at what, what do we want to do or how do we want to so we're trying to find these working class leaders, bring them 
into the forefront um, as people who are um, who can teach and who can help to set policies about land management. Okay, so then uh, we just came back from a trip to Alberta, Canada, um, which is had flooding a few years ago and is now dealing with a severe drought and horrendous wildfires. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we, in this case, we weren't monitoring farms that had already been practicing. We were teaching at agricultural research stations. And, um, and we were seeing a lot of discouragement. People who were doing GMO trials and failing because there was just the grass would crunch when you walked on a lawn was crunching there. Interestingly, the only thing that was green in the lawn was dandelions because they have deeper tap roots. <laughs> so. All right, um, so we're going to go quickly here. Um, a lot of really interesting young people and actually interestingly folks from Africa working at these research stations there, ready to learn something new. Um, this group through some slides. These are some of the workshops that we did. A lot of interest from all different ages, people desperate to figure out how to get water into the ground. Judy's next book is going to be about water. Um, climate change is all about water, soil carbon is all about water. Um, and then last week um, I spent um, studying with a bunch of um, plant genetics researchers, high school teachers, and students um, about soil carb about you know, photosynthesis and carbon partitioning, how, to, how carbon moves through plants. Interestingly, they weren't teaching that it moves into the soils, but I raising my hand and bringing that up and by the end the students well, when they did their presentations they were all saying well as Dee said the, you know the microorganisms in the soil and we think maybe we are. <laughs> um, so uh, the last thing I'll just say is that I am um, currently uh, working with a bunch of schools we have seven schools here in Vermont one in New Hampshire one in California one in Chicago and a few in California or one in Florida a few in California that um, all want curriculum on soil carbon. Um, I have a small grant that's come through, but I'm looking for quite a bit more money so that we can get a group of us working together to write that curriculum so that it's ready um, by probably not first thing in the fall, but um, but, in, but by this school year. Because this is the International Year of Soils and we want to do that. Just very quickly explain to them what this is. Okay, so, so this is, this is um, we're measuring CO2 coming off of different soils. And I went outside and I collected, this was a little experiment I designed last week. We got to play with all these funny gadgets that I never thought would be fun, but now I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, So these were sensors that measuring CO2, and I collected soil that was under grass, not very healthy grass, but grass. And I collected soil that was under, um, uh, Wood chips and, 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 and under gravel. Um, and interestingly, go to the next slide. So the wood that was under grass was letting off way more CO2. And I said to these students, you know, it looks like we shouldn't have like living turf, right? Because it's adding much more CO2 to the environment. <laughs> but what you have to understand is it couldn't do that without much more carbon under the ground. It's the carbon based life forms that are under the ground that are emitting that CO2. And in a functioning grassland, like Seth was showing, um, the, the animals and the plants are, are taking up that CO2 through their stomata, and they're turning it into more carbohydrates, more sugars that feed the microorganisms. So it, it's a, it's a, you know, positive. I don't know. You corrected me. Positive, negative. I don't know. It's a feedback loop. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> um, positive life cycle. What's that? It's a positive life cycle. It's a positive life cycle, yeah. Um, so it's so it's basically, um, carbon should be moving, and it should be growing things. It should be creating things. It's a creative force. Okay. Okay, we will now hear from Joanna Brown, is a uh, graduate student at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University, and she just completed a research fellowship for two months in Southern Africa. Hello, everyone. 
Yeah, so this is the title of my research fellowship through the Thai Institute for the Environment. Uh, it's research that I hope will become my dissertation in the coming years. <laughs> okay, so the idea here is that there are a number of different conservation grazing strategies um, out there. And the reason for this is because there's a huge amount of need for an alternative to the way that we're managing livestock. Now, um, so mist, with even grass-fed beef, if not managed properly, can cause huge problems to the grasslands. It can uh, reduce biodiversity, it can cause erosion, it can cause um, nutrient pollution of waterways. And then, of course, that is actually the better alternative to what is the dominant way that we manage livestock in this country, which is in confined, confined animal feeding operations, or payloads. Uh, which is this picture on the right here. Um, that industrial livestock production, by some estimates, uses as much as half of the water consumed in America, and as many as a third of the calories that we produce, also using all of these chemicals and water and all sorts of other inputs that are both expensive for a farmer and for the environment. Um, also, there is, um, right, of course, there's secondary costs as well, both to the waterways, such as hypoxia, and even issues like foodborne disease, like E. coli, are spread more because of what we're feeding our cows and what we're managing. <clears throat> so there is a number of conservation grazing strategies out there. Um, in 2011, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, through the USDA, uh, published a literature review of these conservation grazing strategies. They reviewed these top three. And what they determined is that these conservation grazing strategies have moderate to no potential for mitigating damage to these grasslands. And furthermore, even if you do implement them and you do experience some regeneration of that landscape, they promise you that it will not be profitable. The reason it cannot be profitable is for two main reasons. First of all, you have to keep your animals as sparsely distributed as possible, which requires a lot of labor to keep them all spread out. And also, you, can ha you have to maintain very low stocking rates, because having too many animals all in the same place causes compaction, according to the USDA. Now, this is the discrepancy, this issue of high density and high stocking rates, because as we may recall from the enormous birds that once were on this planet, that, I mean, nothing defines a herd of American buffalo like high stocking rates and high density. <laughs> um, and so holistic plant grazing employs that concept and questions that assumption that we need to be reducing stocking rates and reducing density, and in fact manages these animals to mimic the behavior of wild herds, such as the American buffalo, um, which is a good image for us because you, you in our country, we used to have millions and millions and millions of buffalo, um, easily as many as the livestock that we have now. And actually, those animals roamed the most fertile soils on our planet, what we have converted now to our bread basket that produces just millions of acres of soy and corn. Now, that there's a discrepancy there. There's a logical disconnect and a logical fallacy there. And so that is what the question of my project is. Now there's a number of characteristics of wild grazing megafauna that differentiate them from the way that conventional grazing works. Carl was kind enough to use through most of these concepts, so I will only point out that what's really extremely exciting about this last point of never returning to the same grazing lands until those grasses have totally restored um, is because actually this point in particular has huge implications for atmospheric carbon. Um, these grasslands, these native grasses, they have this very unique characteristic where they'll maintain a proportion of sometimes one to five in terms of the above ground matter to the below ground matter. So what you're seeing above ground is often only a sixth of the total volume of the plant. And when these grasses are allowed to grow very tall, and then once they're tall, are then raised, they'll actually slough off, which is to cut the unnecessary root systems in this, that same proportion, which is 
a major way of how soil organic matter is being trapped underground through this grazing. It's effectively putting soil organic matter underground without having to till it up to get it there. First place. And then biodegrades and it feeds microorganisms and all of our other little friends. That, well, okay, so that, all of these conditions are, have created what is called a mollusol, which is among the most fertile soils on the planet, and they only exist in the areas that have traditionally been, or have historically been grasslands. And this map is the sort of neon green that you can see sort of around our bread basket and also the Eurasian bread basket there. Um, and what's especially interesting about this is that actually those mollusols didn't even start developing until the huge herds of megafauna evolved. Which is to say that it's not that the soils came first and then the megafauna followed because there was grass there. That, those grasslands didn't start developing until there were the huge herds to help with that synergy and to build that soil up. Okay, so, um, so that's the question of my study. Um, I'm asking, is it true that high stocking rates and high density necessarily cause depletion of vegetative ground cover and necessarily causes the impairment of the water holding capacity of the soil? Is that what's causing desertification? Because that is, according to the Natural Resources Conservation Service, exactly what's causing and I question that. My hypothesis is that under holistic plant grazing, uh, the herds managed to have high stocking rates and high density do not degrade these resources, but in fact improve these resources no matter how propitious that plot is to desertification in the first place. This is based on 30 years of qualitative accounts that this would actually um, I won't go into my methodology into too much detail. Effectively, the herders that work at African Center for Holistic Management, they, when they're working every day, they walk as many as 12 kilometers, I found, um, and they surround the herd. They each are holding a GPS unit, which allows me to draw a polygon around the herd and track which plots of land have been treated on any given day, and at least for a year, hopefully they do it for longer than that. Um, we're also tracking the GPS coordinates of the crawls which are the enclosures, the movable corrals that the animals are kept in overnight and are moved every week, which I believe that would actually be the largest animal impact of any of these things. So that's gonna be the highest density, the highest, the, for the longest amount of time with the highest stocking rates. So if you can track where the crawls have been and make a point about that, I feel that there's no doubt about what, whether or not this animal impact is beneficial or detrimental. Um, yes, and we'll be taking soil samples of those crawl sites and comparing the soil moisture content to the soil within the crawl and juxtaposing that to the both an adjacent plot immediately next to it that was not under crawl treatment as well as the Huangue National Park which is borders the Mango Bay Ranch and also has a number much more much it has more rivers there so there's really no reason that they would have if we have more soil moisture in our soil and they have more rivers, um, this is definitely to do with the groundwater soil retention indicator. Um, here's a map. Can you go back one? This is a map of all of the crawl sites that I went to in a week. Um, and I took GPS coordinates of all of them. They're coded with the dates that the crawl is there. I also have the stocking rates for those times uh, and also photographic records that are GPS and time stamped. So hopefully that will do something because I have just thousands of patients. <laughs> okay, here's just one example. This is a, sort of a finder map of one of the tracks of July 19th. I just wanted to give you a, a context. So zoom in. Slide. And then, okay, so you can see here each of these different colors, blue, red, green, are each a herder. So I'll be able to go for any given time that will create a polygon for me. And then yellow is the cow that I made a guess color for, and so then I'll be able to also determine the geospatial relationship between the herder and the herd. So you can do the size of the herd. Sure. Just one cow. 
Oh yeah, so currently the, the herd is 527 cattle. It's been approximately that since I'm going to start the study in 2013. So looking retrospectively to January 2013, when it was about 497, so it's not a huge difference. Now they're at four or 527, but I will be keeping track of the density and also the stocking rate throughout. So um, I hope that this data will not only account for the incredible progress that they're making using holistic grazing, plant grazing, um, but also I hope this data can more tangibly become a grazer fund fundraiser where people can sponsor and every acre that we treat with holistic grazing management give us a nickel or a quarter, something like that, and really give people the account of what of land that was desert that they personally Transform. And these are the herders who are absolutely the heroes of all of this with the new solar panel they have to charge their GPS batteries. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. We're going to go to our keynote featured speaker tonight, Dr. Bill Muma. Um, just retired from it. A uh, distinguished, uh, distinguished career from a, from a distinguished career at Tufts University, um, where he uh, founded the Center for International Environment and Resource Policy, or SERP, at the Fletcher School of International Law and Diplomacy. So he basically started the 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 environmental program within the International School of Law and Diplomacy. So that was really. Uh, Quite, a, quite an achievement. And um, his career as, an, as a um, distinguished scientist goes way back to um, the time when we were concerned about um, aerosols and the chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere and the Montreal Accords. He, Bill's uh, scientific background was of, of a low temperature chemistry low temperature chemistry. Well, where is their low temperature chemistry? In the ozone. Yeah. And all of a sudden, well, who knows more about that? So, so there's, there's the very, very famous story of, um, of Jim Hansen, uh, James Hansen, the former head of the, uh, the, uh, the, the atmospheric um, um, the, 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 the Goddard research is part of, part of uh, sort of the government's chief scientist who was the one who, who created the warning, really, about global warming. And uh, there, there's this famous story about before Congress in 1988, and we were at 350 parts per million then, and that's when he famously said, you know, this is, this is serious now. It was, it was this sort of the shot heard around the world in terms of getting the narrative into the public, um, or getting the message into the public narrative about climate. Well, sitting at that congressional panel, but not often highly noted, was also Bill Luma. Okay, he was just like two people down from Hansen. So he's wooden degree separation from the world's most famous climate scientist. So uh, we are very happy to have you here. Thank you, really. It is Thank you, sir. So please welcome. Him. Uh, it's very interesting walking in here because uh, I, I do have some people and uh, I'm not conceptual. <laughs> and uh, that's because they had either uh, migrated up here from the Boston area or uh, one of them's a former student of mine. Uh, you, just, you just never know. Right? You have to be really careful because you can always run into people again and again. <laughs> and it matters. It really does. Uh, thank you for having me here. I, what I want to do is. Um, I mean, you've just heard some remarkable the, uh, public information about uh, this whole business of thinking about, about soils and so on. I want to expand that just a little bit and dispel a myth. I heard somebody talk about carbon offset. We can't afford carbon offsets. We obviously have to stop burning fossil fuels. That's just a prerequisite. But as was correctly pointed out, that doesn't remove anything that's in the atmosphere now from the atmosphere. So 
So we have to do everything we can on the energy side and everything we can do on the biosphere side, the living part of the planet, to actively remove and store the carbon dioxide we've already put there. And you'll see why when I talk the presentation in just a minute. So we have to think about renewable energy and restoring soils, restoring forests, restoring wetlands. Since I first got interested in the soils part, which actually I got that by, by uh, reading Omni Wars Dilemma and the story about Polyface Farm, which is not a dry land area at all. It's a very, very temperate, at the end of the year, kind of rain area. Uh, a grass farmer, right? And his, he was producing four times as many cows per acre as his neighbors were. And at the same time, producing chickens, and at the same time, growing crops, and at the same time, doing all these things on the same piece of land. And it's a remarkable story. I thought that's really interesting. And everything about it made sense. And I, well, in my training, I'm a chemist by training. I, I, I did uh, practice the dark arts of chemistry for half my career. <laughs> And then I, I uh, was applying those dark arts to the environment from the very beginning. And when the opportunity came, I had to say I couldn't do both the laboratory science and the environmental science applied to policy. And so I decided, you know, I've had so many wonderful chemistry students who are out doing great chemistry that I'm not needed there anymore. And I think there's a greater need for someone who can work on the policy side, bringing the science to the policy. So that was the decision I made. In, uh, in, in 1988, and uh, that's when I started working on climate as the first director of the climate program for the World Resources Institute in Washington, just getting started in that field at that time. And that's what Jim Hansen testified, and that's why I was at that hearing. Um, then Seth started showing up, and he started talking about the soil stuff. I said, yeah, uh, I'm not sure that's important. But I got other things to do, Seth. He's very persistent, however. Seth kept coming back and coming back. And finally, I began really reading the stuff he gave me. And the next thing was, you know, there's some amazing things here. And I said, well, do um, you think we could ever get Alan Savory to come here? So I said, well, I don't know which one. So I sent out an invitation to Alan Savory to come and give a presentation at Tufts University. Alan told me later he had never been invited by a university to speak. In fact, I learned that the University of Texas had forbade anyone to invite like them. And other universities have done the same thing because his views ran so counter to the truth from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. <laughs> and everything the U.S. Department of Agriculture was doing, I remember the USDA also tried to kill organic agriculture in the beginning, right? They, they tried to, to, to strangle, it in the, strangle it in the grid, so, or the massacre, or whatever it was, to make sure that it never would get out of there because it's, it's hokum and it doesn't matter and any, everything else. Well, this is actually a problem with established science, is that it is conservative in the sense that it builds, it's, it, it builds up over time knowledge. And there's path dependence to knowledge. What you have done determines what you do next, which determines what comes after that, which determines what comes after that. And if you weren't on that path, it's not likely to make it until there's a revolution. I thought you said it perfectly. There's a conflict in logic here, right? Something's not making sense. And finally, enough people realize that things don't make sense, that there's a transformation, and that we have great scientific discoveries. <laughs> and we start in a new direction. And we have to be careful that that path doesn't come so deeply worn that we get stuck in that rut and miss a lot of important things along the way. We're not there in the soils yet, I can assure you of that. It's a long ways to go before we're in the rut. Um, so trying to get people aboard has been, been, been an issue. Um, let me just very, very give you just three quick slides on the current state of the climate. Uh, I'll go ahead and just give the next slide. Uh, the climate is in fact changing, just in case you had <laughs> succumbed to the argument that, uh, you know, there's no more global warming, it's increasing, don't worry about it. It's over. 
Um, unfortunately, you know, the land and sea temperatures are rising, and we now realize that, as you'll see in a moment, that the graph we've been looking at is a little misleading for reasons we'll go over in a moment. Sea ice is disappearing dramatically in the Arctic. 2012, half the ice was gone in the middle of September from where it was in 1979. In a very short period of time, we have lost half of the surface area of the ice. And this past February, when it's at its maximum, there was a er huge area that was missing from where it was in 1979 when we started satellite measurements of the Arctic sea ice. So this is real. It is, it is probably three quarters of the volume of sea ice is melted, is gone, in just about 30 years. That's a pretty dramatic change since it, it lasted, obviously, through the last ice age and through 10,000, 11,000 years, and we managed to kill it off in 30 years. Pretty, pretty amazing change. Glacier snow on these sheets were shrinking. Uh, Greenland, uh, as uh, the, the melting of ice on Greenland has tripled since 1990. Mm -hmm. Greatest triples. The scene chasing ice, there's that spectacular scene where they just happen to be there with their cameras when three cubic miles of ice cleave off across a bay into the water in a 70 minute period. That's just extraordinary. I mean, I, it's terrifying watching it. I can't imagine what it's like being up on the ice on the other side of the fjord and then wondering, hmm, I wonder if what I'm standing on is going to go next. <laughs> so, species are moving into cold, cooler regions. This is happening in the oceans causing fishing conflicts, by the way, because the fish that used to be in my territorial waters are now in your territorial waters, and my fishermen have been fishing them for generations, and somehow we, mm. those boundaries tend to be fixed, and habits get to be fixed, and that's a collision. Um, the synchronization among species, particularly migratory species, is not coinciding with the um, emergence of certain plants or insects or along the Atlantic seaboard is horseshoe crabs. Uh, there are certain uh, uh, shorebirds that depend on the eggs of horseshoe crabs and they're arriving before those are there now. And some of those harvests have been plummeting in some of those populations. Uh, and tropical diseases and pests are moving from the tropics into temperate zones. And we are sitting here right now with the lily adelgi, which will wipe out all our hemlock trees, just down in Connecticut, ready for the next series, decade of warm winters before it's up here in <coughs> Vermont. Next, please. So here's the famous kind of graph showing rising temperatures over time, and this little bit of leveling at the end has been the cause of great skepticism. You see, it stopped. The world is no longer warming. The theory must be wrong. <laughs> Well, hang on, 2015 will be the hottest year on record. 2014 was the previous warmest year. The fact that 11 of the 12 warmest years uh, have all occurred in the last 12 years. 14 of the 15 warmest years have all occurred in the 21st century. Uh, and the only year that before that was 1998, pretty close to the 21st century, but just because of the, you know, when the odometer turns over, it didn't quite make it into the 21st century. Um, and it was a this uh, this peak this peak right uh, right here, uh, and then it's been wiggling up and down. And this is 2014, and 2015 is already so far ahead that it can't possibly be anything but tied for the warmest year on record. So um, it's believed now that that uh, one of the reasons for this leveling off is that so much more warming is occurring in the Arctic. And we don't have a lot of measuring stations up there. So that's being underrepresented. So now that we're getting that, we're going to see a recalibration of this and an attempt to try to see, well, what did we miss in the past? But it is getting warmer, there's no question about it. We have that thermometer called the Arctic ice sheet. We have the Greenland ice sheet, which are telling us even if we don't have the thermometers in place. Okay. So heat trapping gases are increasing, continue to increase, no question about it. Um, we have um, uh, we 
have carbon dioxide on the left, and it's 10,000 years, and then <coughs> boom, straight up just about in the last 150 years. That's all from fossil fuels and deforestation to some extent, and soil loss. And I'll come back to the soil loss in just a moment. Uh, methane and other gas, big increases, and nitrous oxide from uh, agriculture, other big increases. Okay, those are all trapping heat. Now, here is, like, to me, one of the most terrifying bits of scientific news done by, by research scientists. Susan Solomon at MIT published this uh, paper in 2007. This paper shows that the climate change that takes place due to increases in carbon dioxide concentration is largely irreversible for a thousand years after emissions stop. The following cessation of emissions remove of atmospheric carbon dioxide decreases radiative forcing, that is the heat trapping, but is largely compensated by slower loss of heat in the ocean. So the atmospheric temperatures do not drop significantly for at least a thousand years. So, I just find that to be extremely disturbing. Next slide. Here are data. Here's what I'm showing. If carbon dioxide, if we stop, if we rise up to 450 parts per million sometime in this century and then decrease, then, then, then uh, decrease immediately to zero, that's the assumption here. No more emissions after we reach 450. It drops off along that curve. And it stays pretty close to 400 parts per million out beyond the year 3000. Don't see many graphs of the year 3000. But hey, I'm not running for president. Seriously, Donald Trump told me the other day he's not running for president in the year 3000, so he doesn't care. <laughs> he didn't tell me that directly, but he told it to me indirectly. <laughs> um, and if you look at these other things, and here we are, we're already at 400 parts per million. And, um, you look at the temperatures, we're already up here at almost one degree above, and if we go to 450, we'll be up here, we'll peak up here at the, um, and, and then we will start uh, trailing off. But for a thousand years, we will be stuck with that rising temperature. So if you figure four generations um, a century, right, then you go out a thousand years, right? So that's four hundred. Forty. Forty. Forty generations. Forty generations you have into the future when we have condemned. And it's still not lovely. It's still lovely. It still hasn't gone down very much. So this is why we not only have to stop putting it in, we have to start taking it out. I can't think of a clearer way to say it than that. We have to do that. And soils are one way to take it out. Forests are one way to take it out. Restoring uh, gra grasslands, obviously, for soils. Agricultural lands. I mean, the amount of carbon that we have released from agricultural lands is quite astounding. And we could put it back in. And we would have better agriculture. We would be more productive per, per acre if we did that. We would store more water. We would be, and as climate change, as people have said, and, as, as, uh, as, as your book is going to, I'm sure, point out, you know, water is, what is, is one of the big issues of, of a changed climate. And uh, as Seth demonstrated, and others have demonstrated, the amount of water that we have in the soils depends upon how much carbon we have in the soils. So we can begin to speak, can begin to address all of these issues together in a holistic comprehensive, integrated, whatever term you'd like to use, manner. Okay, next. Um, this is, this. Seth showed this, but I wanted to show it again because I think it's so important that um, if, if people look at and, and show how much carbon dioxide is coming from um, agriculture and uh, for deforestation, it's about 70% of the total carbon dioxide. That's a lot of number. So 15 to 20%, somewhere in that range. People say, oh, that's not so important. We'll focus on the fossil fuels, and we won't worry about that. Oh, and then these other gases that are another kind of 20% of the uh, industrial gases, the nitrous oxide from agriculture, and so forth. So you look at all of these things, and you say, all right, let's just look at the carbon dioxide part. So um, 
plants take up about 120 billion tons, or 800 billion tons in the atmosphere. Okay? And then plants transpire, respire, that is, their metabolism puts about half that amount back in, in, into the air, and then they put some in the soil, and the soils put about half of that amount back in. But net, the land and forest and plants and wetlands and everything absorb about three more billion tons every year than uh, on net. So there, there's, there's three billion more tons that goes in than comes out. And if you look at the total, uh, the oceans do about the same. They say it's over about two. So of the nine billion tons we emit, three are absorbed by the photosynthesis or not equal to three, and two by the oceans. So we only net at four billion tons instead of nine billion tons. Of course, we used to think it was wonderful that the oceans did this for us, but we now know that this is making the oceans more acidic. That's destroying the basic phytoplankton in the ocean. It's destroying every shelled creature. Those of us who like oysters and clams and those kinds of things, those are already in trouble in many places. Up here in Maine, the, um, uh, the uh, oyster farms, um, found that they were having an 80% mortality rate in their larvae and they put them into their, their, um, their seawater ponds. They checked the acidity, it was high. When they neutralized it back to what it had been before, it had an 80% survival rate. Similar things happening in the Pacific Northwest. And so we're already, this isn't in the future. <laughs> this is now. So if we could enhance this uptake. And what gets into the soils really comes from the plants, as you heard, right? So we've got to increase the amount of photosynthesis. And that means we have to restore the places we have degraded, the places that no longer produce the way they did, whether that's forest or wetlands or whatever it is. Okay, next. Uh, this is just a so there are multiple approaches. The first is to reduce emissions from fossil fuels. And let me just let me just give a little sermonette about fossil fuels. We think of them as the great villain in climate change, and they are. They are villains in other ways as well. How many people died from the Ebola crisis? How many died from the Ebola crisis? How many? No, eleven. Love it up. Horrible. No way anybody wants to die. It's horrific. Good thing we intervened. You had sent six billion dollars to Africa to make sure it didn't come here. Or maybe it was our generosity and our <laughs> military concerns, or whatever it was, we spent six billion dollars. What human action kills 3.7 billion, it said 3.7 million people? Air pollution from fossil fuel. Half the population, 600 million Indians, die three years earlier on average because of air pollution from burning fossil fuels. In the United States, 200,000 people die early every year because of inhaling fumes from fossil fuels. What are we spending to deal with that? We're subsidizing. We're subsidizing. That's right. We are making more fossil fuels cheaper, and 40% uh, of the coal in the United States comes from federal lands, the lands that you and I as citizens supposedly own and our government is the steward of. And during the Bush administration, they didn't even collect the fees. I mean, this is really quite insane, I think. Secondly, the military is all concerned about climate change because it will lead to more instability in the world. What they've totally overlooked at is the number of conflicts in the world that are over oil and gas. I mean, name one that isn't. How about water rights? There are no wars over water rights yet. <laughs> Interesting thing. There may be, but there aren't yet. But over oil and gas, 
Right, the only one I can think of that isn't are Arabs or, or the Palestinians and the Israelis. <laughs> and they would rather fight over rocky soil that none of us can imagine is worth fighting over, but for historical and cultural and religious reasons, they fight over it. Okay? So let's put that one aside. Ukraine. What's that about? It's about gas. The natural gas pipelines from Russia to Europe and the offshore gas off of Crimea. 200 miles off Crimea is now Russia's to exploit, not Ukraine's. What about the whole mess in Iraq from the beginning? You think that had anything to do with oil? You no, know, when George Bush the first said we went into Kuwait to protect democracy? <laughs> because the, the Iraqis were drilling into, across the border, into the Kuwaiti oil fields. Henry Lovin's great comment was, I bet we wouldn't have gone in if the great production of Kuwait was brought in. <laughs> George Bush's least favorite thing. So, uh, Nigeria, the conflicts in Nigeria. China and every one of its neighbors in the South China Sea are on tender hooks because China keeps aggressively taking over more and more of the area that the South China Sea, even building artificial islands to get the 200 mile circle around them has no question there for oil and gas exploration. I mean, imagine how many wars have been started by solar panels on our roofs? <laughs> how many people have been killed by falling solar panels or any other disaster you can think of as solar panels? I can't think of a one. So fossil fuels are the cause of just, and how about human rights violations? Look at Nigeria. I mean, the execution of Ken Sarawiwa, the famous, the famous Agoni poet, for opposing the central government with the backing of Shell. He was imprisoned and executed, along with a whole group of others. Every day, there is more oil spill in a year in Nigeria than the entire BP oil spill. It's horrific. People are just drunk, so everything in order to get oil because people make money selling oil. And then we have all our great allies with their great human rights records, like Saudi Arabia and so forth, to whom we give more guns and weapons and airplanes in order to fight Yemen or wherever they want to fight. I mean, it is insane when you think about it, the cost of fossil fuels. We spend $140 billion alone to protect the sea lanes from the Persian Gulf to our allies to get oil to them. What would 140 billion dollars do for solar panels or wind turbines or energy efficient houses or anything you want? Education, better health care, you name it. Imagine what you do with 140 billion dollars. So fossil fuels are a huge problem. Okay, just go where are you? So we have to reduce those emissions. And we have to eliminate deforestation and forest degradation. And the sort of good news is, going into Paris, there will be something called reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. And that means tropical forests. It doesn't mean North American forests or European forests or Russian forests or Canadian forests, which are much larger than anybody else's forests. But at least there's something going forward that says that will count. If we or find ways to restore those forests and to protect them, those will count as credits. That's what a tropical country that can't afford to do much good <coughs> is. They can basically protect their forests and at the same time respect the rights of the indigenous people who live there. That's, that's what the plus is for. That's why that's in there. It took a lot of negotiation. But we can't carbonize the rights of indigenous people. They have rights to the forest and the land just like any other people should have. And uh, so that's a very been a very delicate bit of diplomacy. I'm rather pleased with the way it's come out overall. If we allow degraded and second growth forests to grow, establish new forests on lands previously forested, this would reduce emissions by about five billion tons a year. Now remember, we're only putting four billion tons in net right now. I mean it's all those great figures or soils, add this in too. Just think if we could do this. 
And we could, if we did this, according to, to uh, uh, Steve Houghton at the Woods Hole Research Center, uh, by 2100, the concentration of the atmosphere would be down to 333 parts per million. We would have beat 350 by the their own goal. Mm -hmm. Just with the forest part. We can do more good than that with the soils part. So even if we don't do either of them particularly well, we can probably get into this point. But we have to do some of them. That's what I'm Next. So um, this is the part about degraded grasslands. If we restore them somewhere between 2 and 5 billion tons per year um, uh, from the world, again, you know, comparable to forests, um, additional uh, removal of soil in you know, agricultural land soils, which we have just badly, badly degraded, and uh, preventing loss from wetlands. Now, there's a new piece of news which is really disturbing, which is if we stay, if we reach 2, 2 degrees Celsius warming, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, 30% of the frozen peatlands in the north would fall and release carbon dioxide, which means there will be a knock on warming effect. Which will then more warming. Uncontrollable. Uncontrollable. So people look at two degrees like a target. No, it's it's a place you don't want to go, right? At least we have a number where we know we don't want to go, but we really don't want to go above one. And we're at 0.9 right now. And probably more than more than a few tenths has already built into the, to the system so far. Unless we start doing this other stuff. That's the only hope. Now, it's interesting, in Susan Solomon's paper, she says, unless we do geoengineering. So people have said, well, isn't planting trees geoengineering? Isn't restoring soils geoengineering? And my answer is, absolutely not. Geoengineering is when you sprinkle fairy dust up in the stratosphere and let it reflect sunlight away. And it doesn't solve the problem. It just, it just addresses the symptoms. The oceans still get acidic, right? Imagine managing that for 10,000 years, sprinkling fairy dust up in the stratosphere to keep things going. What this does is it addresses the underlying problem, too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It pulls it out, and it has other benefits. Better agricultural productivity, better forest productivity, more biodiversity, more water accessibility. I don't call that geoengineering. I call that fixing what we broke. And so I like to call it restorative development. Pattern of development where we meet our needs in a way that makes things better rather than worse. Think about every organism on this planet. Whatever it does, it creates a niche for some other organism. Except for humans when we have to do asphalt parking lots. That's the one exception that I think really epitomizes it all, you know? You, you asphalt a parking lot, I don't see a whole lot of of benefit to any other organism, including ourselves. <laughs> so here's what we need to do. We need to think about this as a way of integrated, right? What you were hearing, integrated work, so that we can really restore this. So enough numbers here to get us where we have to go to pull enough carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but we have to do it. And, and uh, so let's just run through a couple of other things here. Here's just the grasslands. 40% is, is, is Sested, 31% is forest, 14% is um, woody savanna and savannas, 13% is open and closed shrub, 8% non-woody grasslands, 6% tundra, 7% desert. So these are the two big areas. And one of the things about photosynthesis is it's pretty inefficient. Like only about in half and one percent of the solar energy actually gets into energy in the plant, in, 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 in plants. And in the forest, it's probably closer to half a percent. But let's say it's one percent. Unfortunately, we've got lots of acres out there. Each one working at this relatively meager percentage is, adds up to a huge amount of carbon storage. So we have to keep that in mind. And when um, um, a delicate issue that always comes up in doing them is how many of us burn wood in the wintertime? I'm raising my hand. Okay. okay. Not a bad thing to do. I remember the first time I bought my first wood stove in, uh, in August of 1973. 
because I had just bought a house and it was using a huge amount of oil. And in 1969, there was a Santa Barbara oil spill, and I said, I'll be Tom, if I'm going to buy more oil, I have to. I'm going to get this down as much as I can. In October 1973 came the oil shock, the first uh, Arab oil boycott. That's when I became an energy expert in the eyes of my university friends. <laughs> How did you know to buy a wood stove three months before the first oil shock? <laughs> <laughs> Something, you know, showing up, as Woody Allen says, is 80% of success. So you show up, you're, you're almost there. So, um, I burned wood, and I remember those times. Oh, gosh, I remember how cold it was. Those of us who are old enough to remember this. And, and if you go to a party, and, uh, well, we're keeping our thermostat at 56. Well, we're keeping ours at 54. Well, we keep ours. We turn it down to 45 at night, except in the kids' room, and so on and so forth. And uh, I burned uh, three cords last winter. I burned four. I burned five. And, it, and wait, this is going the wrong way. <laughs> I should burn one. And I'm perfectly and it turns out to be a responsible wood burner, you need an efficient stove, one that does not put out some of the nastier pollutants that a, a straight pipe stove can put out. I found having an external uh, air intake that brings in fresh outside air and doesn't just exhaust the air, I just heat it up the, up the, up the stack is a really good thing to do. And it burns much cleaner, much hotter. You've got that dense cold air coming in, it's great. And then burn it in a house that's really insulated and really tight. And because you're bringing the air in from outside, that's not a problem. You do not get puffback or anything like that. So you can be really re a responsible wood burger. And you should make sure you get your wood locally and it's not brought in from far away, because that's how we're spreading ash borer and all the other things around, is by moving firewood around. And, and finally, um, to the extent possible, use deadfall. Don't cut down a perfectly good oak or maple tree and then chop it up into little pieces and burn it. Now I know you get more heat out of it if you've aged it long enough and so forth, but on my place, there's so much deadfall every spring, I can go out and pretty much get what I need for the winter, just for what's coming out. And that's going to decay anyway in a fairly short period of time. Whereas if that tree remains standing and I didn't cut it down, it's going to be sucking up carbon dioxide. So there's a lot of things one can do to be a responsible wood burner, even though we are cutting down the roof, we are removing something from the forest, and we are putting some carbon dioxide in the air. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said about using wood to produce electricity. For what? Fire Using wood to, to make electricity. And the reason for that is the most efficient plants are 25% efficient. Wood produces less heat per unit of carbon dioxide than coal. Put it another way, to get the same amount of heat from wood as you get from coal, you have to put up more carbon dioxide. And if you cut the tree and burn it in a few minutes, it takes, in this climate, 50 to 100 years to grow back. Everybody says it grows back. I always believed that. I always thought it was carbon neutral. It's only carbon neutral if you believe that getting it back 50 or 100 years from now is the same as burning it now. There's always more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So that's another reason to use deadfall. Is that Many capitals. And I'm saying, but to make electricity from it is really ridiculous. Photosynthesis, 1% efficient. Convert to electricity, 25% of 1%. It's a quarter of a percent. If I take an acre of trees and cut them down and send them to the power plant, I'll get a certain amount of electricity. If I cover an area the same size with photo panels at 20% efficient, that's 80 times as much electricity on that same piece of the same size of the Now, I'm not advocating cutting down forests and putting solar panels there. We have enough gravel pits, landfills, parking lots to cover, <laughs> rooftops. We don't need that. You know, there, there are enough dump sites in America to provide seven times the electricity that the United States needs for all households. So we're going to be able to find places that don't disrupt them. Anyway, so that's just a, trying to get the numbers right and trying to think of it in, in an integrated way. We've got to do something to keep our forests going and um, 
the, the other thing is there's only one state, one political entity in the world that even requires that a tree be planted if one is cut down for fuel for 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 biofuel for electricity production. That's New York State. Massachusetts is the only state that requires that it be efficient. That at least half of the electricity, in fact, half of the heat has to be actually used. Well, if you're only getting 25%, that's 75% of the waste. So you have to somehow capture that and use it in some way in Massachusetts to get a, 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 to get a half a, a, a renewable energy credit. So meanwhile, we're cutting down the forest in the southeast, shipping them up, sending them to Britain where they count them to zero. And under international accounting rules, we have to count it as 100% emitted from the United States because of taking down the trees. I don't know, there's just some crazy things going on. Everybody's trying, and everybody's well-intentioned, but we need to do the math. We need to do the math right now. That's just what I do. So go on. Uh, well, here are just some examples of great things that have happened. So this is in a part uh, in, uh, in Niger, a part of Africa, right? Near the equator, uh, in, the, um, in the Sahel. Here's the next slide, just shows what they've done. This was absolute just scrub and bare ground. It's now um, um, 5 million hectares, supporting almost 5 million people in agroforestry. They allowed the little trees that could grow to be spaced out to grow, and they plant among them. The sun is so intense that it burns out those crops. So now they get shade, shade grown things that uh, help them uh, be productive. And they trim the trees. The trimmings are used for fuel. And this is afforestation, so there's more carbon being stored that's being released from the birds with the trimmings of these trees. So this is in a place that trees weren't growing before. Not growing anymore. Because the goats got them before. Or people cut them down because they were in the way of the plants. So now they've got them all worked out. Next one, please. Um, this is what I think people don't understand. When, Talk about putting things carbon back into, 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 into the soils. Um, there have been 230 billion tons added to the atmosphere of carbon. A third of that came from soils. The other two thirds came mostly from burning fossil fuels. So that's a huge amount. And so if we could reverse our bad practices and put it back in, that would be terrific. That would really begin to solve things. I mean, 230. I mean, a third of, of, of uh, that is about 80, 80 billion tons. So that gets us almost back down to where we need to be. Right? It would be, in fact, it would get us below where we need to be. So between, so, so getting those soils right would make a huge, huge difference. Um, so can we accelerate this uptake? So just saying they, they absorb all this and rest of the wetlands. I learned this at the wetlands conference in June, just how much uh, is coming from wetlands. Uh, next. So here are just some examples, some nice pictures. This is Mongolia. That looks pretty great. Right? This is a sheep culture. And just look at the, the it's, it's, it's more dirt than grass. And it's been way overgrazed. Next. Uh, this is in, uh, in Pakistan. This is an area. And this is all just, they just let the animals roam, just as we do in the American West, and in, in, sadly, say, some farms in the wing, we still do that. We just turn the cows out, and you see cows uh, wallowing in muddy places and so forth, because they have no, no grassy areas left. Next. Um, I uh, filled this from, uh, from Jim Lowry, who works with, with many of the people here, just showing how and why this works, where here you are, Building up the soil um, with the plants putting the, the uh, carbon down into the soil, dung beetles putting things in, and um, here, here in Vermont, some of the carbon farmers in Vermont. These are, this is the next generation here working to be, be, be carbon farmers. And the next one just shows you what, uh, what uh, Seth showed you earlier this amazing thing where, where clearly one side is very different from the other. And I love the fact that there's this road here. And if you look here, you can see there's a road over here, too. And I consider this the road to nowhere. <laughs> and this is the road to somewhere we'd probably like to be. So two futures here. I think it's a very symbolic picture, much more than you've ever indicated. Next. Um, this is in um, um, Patagonia and Argentina, a similar picture. Look at the right side and look at the left side. 
left side is holistically managed project done by the Nature Conservancy and with uh, Alan Savory uh, and just on the sheep being heavily, more heavily grazed and moving around on the left side. This side they're just left out there and that's what you get. So it's not unique to a place. It's, it has to be adapted to the place, but it's the basic principle. Just a couple more examples here. Uh, these are guanacos in, in uh, Patagonia, Chile. I was down there last January. Again, spectacular uh, open, open spaces. They seem not to actually degrade these places. I don't know how they avoid it. With that. Somehow, when the cattle and the sheep herders get in there, they tend to uh, serve they have different habits. They have different habits. They go to in one place. Yes, and they also, yeah, but that's just it. We need to learn from what the wildlife there that doesn't degrade it to manage our animals in a similar way. Uh, the Los Plateau in China heavily degraded from centuries of misgrazing, overgrazing, misgrazing, and uh, poor agricultural practices. A uh, major effort was made to restore it using some of these techniques. And this is what it looks like today. This is before anything was done with traditional practices, and this is under some of these more um, uh, holistic management practices. How much time has left? Uh, this is about uh, 20, 20, 20, 20 years, so maybe 25 years. It's a generation, basically. It took a generation to restore it. But it's one of the great success stories in China. Okay, next. Um, uh, this is work by, by Richard Tate that uh, uh, Seth uh, referred to here, high density grazing, multi-species pastures, different grasses. These are pictures of the two soils on adjacent lands. This one was holistically grazed, and now all the way down to here, it's much darker than this soil here, much more colorful. That's after, I think, only about 10 or 12 years of difference. And these these two farms these two farms are, are absolutely adjacent to each other. Two brothers. Two brothers. Right. Yes, two brothers. And one said he'd do it. The other said he said he'd be glad to be the control because the other looked like too much work. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is just a uh, this is actually a caretaker farm in Williamstown, Massachusetts. Sam Elizabeth Smith, whom some of you know, uh, founders of I think the second uh, community supported agriculture farm in the United States. And they retired a couple of years ago. And um, another being pathbreakers, they worked out a way of passing the farm on as an, an, an organic, simply managed farm uh, to, uh, to another farm with the land being held in trust by the Williams Center for Land Foundation. So um, it's just absolutely beautiful. This was, I remember when, when they bought it, it was pure mineral dirt. There was no soil there. There was no carbon content whatsoever. It is rich. This this, uh, this part that they've been farming now for, uh, since uh, 1970, um, so 40 years. It's just incredible the uh, nutrients and the, uh, and, the, and the organic content. What was the creek? It's called Caretaker Farm. <coughs> if you go online, you can find information on it. Well, there are many of these in, in New England now, but this was one of the first and has kind of the longest, one of the longest histories. Uh, and what was the previous use of the It was so a so much it was farm, a farm. It was a 19th century farm, and they they farmed it out, you know, the, the, the land. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and everybody told Sam he was foolish to buy it because it was terrible soil, and, which was true. Uh, but he'd been reading these you know, weird things about how to restore soils and organic agriculture and things like that in the 60s. And, uh, uh, but he was a banker. He uh, quit banking. He was a banker, went to India, city corporation. Two of his kids were born there. They came back. Got a degree from Yale to teach school. He taught school for a while, but this was just it. So uh, he and his wife decided that's what they're going to do. And they did it. And I uh, just took a, a, a Six day bicycle, seven day bicycle tour with them from Amsterdam to Bruges, and um, and they were just astounded as we went through the extensive Dutch agricultural lands. Sam said, "I've never seen 100 acres of spinach in one place before. It's just amazing the size of things, and and looking very healthy." But anyway, so we can do this. We know how to do it. 
and just about two more slides here, one or two more slides. Uh, at the Wetlands Conference, this was stunning for me. If you look at the, the brown is the amount of soil organic carbon, and the green is the living biomass. Tidal salt marshes compared to all tropical forests. When you think of tropical forests, and where all the where all the carbon stored. This is a it's all stored in the soils of salt marshes, many of which we have filled. We filled in half of the ones in New England. And we've done to that what other countries in the tropics have done to mangroves. Throwing them to put in a clam shack or a dump or something or other. It's useless wasteland, but it's not so useless. That's it. So. We just have to get going on this. We're moving too slowly with removing fossil fuels, and even if we are moving completely, that thousand year thing will be made. I think we really just have to get going on this. And we don't have to wait for the fossil fuels to stop. The, if we get started now, we just start doing it. And uh, we need to decide which part of this problem we want to work on. If we want to also put solar panels on our house, that's great. If we want to do that and somehow stuff carbon into the soils and rebuild soils, that's great too. Let's just do it all. And let's forget this business about offsets. As I said, if I, if I offset in the biosphere my carbon emissions from fossil fuels, the same amount of carbon dioxide is still in the atmosphere. Right? And so we haven't made any gain. We have to do both. And this will help us do both and get there to a really sustainable um, climate future. Uh, thank you for the wonderful applause and thanks for coming out. Uh, just a couple very brief things. Um, so we're trying to start a movement, if you will, and uh, so it's going to be hashtag soil for climate, but for the number four. And um, I think we've made a new sign that has the number four. And if people, some people want to stay, we're going to get a picture with us, like holding the sign, okay? So that's a way to get the narrative. The fact is everything these days is a hashtag, right? It all boils down to a hashtag. So soil number four climate, there is a Facebook page. Um, you know, just go to Facebook and put soil in the number four, you'll get to it. And then Carl has a, a sign up if you want to leave uh, email, then you put it there. There were some questions about, yeah, but what about like in Thetford and locally? I apologize, we didn't get enough into that. But you guys know there's a lot of good stuff happening here. There's the Cedar Circle Farm, where Dee has been taking carbon samples there. They're doing biochar and, and they're, they're really there. successful. And uh, Vanessa is living at the uh, Rock Bottom Farm in Stratford, and they've been doing like holistic grazing there and making awesome ice cream. And, um, and Nico up in Berkshire has his beef thing, and he's doing a very progressive type of uh, of grazing and, 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 and so there is a lot happening here and I apologize we didn't get more into the local story maybe next time we'll, we'll get into that some more um, uh, uh, just uh, two other quick business things the rental tonight plus the kitchen is $65 it's very reasonable but that's what it is maybe we'll put out something if people have a few bucks they want to throw in that would be helpful and um, uh, Didi's uh, group you know, she's trying to raise money to, for her curriculum and to do these samples. If you want to talk to her, and you can write a check to the Soil Carbon Coalition. And that'll, that'll be separate than the money you put in the thing, which is just for tonight. Um, I know you all want to continue to have a discussion, but it is getting toward nine. So let's just officially end, and then people can stay and talk about what they want, and then we'll do a picture. Is there any other quick business that we need to say before we... Yeah. Yeah, one thing. Um, is, um, we will be, this is the first of what we hope will be many events um, in the Upper Valley and, and in Vermont. And, um, and secondly, that um, you all, uh, this is quite serious, you all now know more than most people do about this. Um, you are the experts now. We're passing along to you. I mean, Judy, when did you start learning about this? 
Where, where's yeah. you know? I mean, I've been doing it a year, and I'm and I'm teaching an agricultural research station. This is really important things that needs to get passed along. So we're passing it along to you to keep talking about it and read about it, learn about it. Okay, any other important thing? Okay, going once, going twice, three times. All right, we're done. Bye. Bye.